including her own. So, all right, so I'm gonna call to order the uh, August 4th, 2022 Stormwater Management Committee meeting. I'm Dodd Galbraith, I'm the chairman of the committee. You can see all the names of the other committee members up here in front of them. We'll have another committee member be joining us in just a minute. Our first order of business after uh, coming to order is approval, a review and approval of the meeting minutes and decision letters. I want to encourage uh, all of our committee members to um, offer any edits or corrections or anything that they see that needs to be adjusted. Um, and as usual, if we could take that one motion, that'll uh, move things along for us. And uh, started. We usually take some time during the meeting to review them and read them because we're a quasi-judicial body, so everything we deliberate is supposed to be live in front of you. So that's why this might take a little bit longer than it seems it should. So thank you for your patience. This kind of works like uh, being at a restaurant. If you look at the menu, the waiter is never going to come around, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so. Okay. Everybody satisfied? Okay. Right. Uh, I guess I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the June um, minute minute meetings as, lo as well as the decision letters as they are presented. All right. We have a motion to approve uh, the minutes and the decision letters as presented. Is there a second? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? The, 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 the May minutes are in here just for information, or we're going to do a second motion on that? I, I think we already approved that. I just wanted to have it in there. There was a change that needed to be made um, originally in the minutes. So I had said Ms. Stokes recused herself, and then she also voted. Ah. Um, but I think we've kind of cleared that up already. I just want to make sure that it looks good. Any advice? I don't know that we need to vote on that again. Any advice from council on that? Um, so what was the what was the cleanup? Uh, I, it was just an inconsistency. Okay. I had said that. And was that inconsistency called out in what was approved last month? It was, yeah. Okay. okay. Great. All right. So we got a motion on the table, been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? All right. Seeing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. All right, got a unanimous approval of the minutes and decision letters. Okay, all right, so our first item of business is uh, the case 2022-00009 at 5420 Stonebox Lane. Looks like our applicants are already up front. So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna read you your legal rights. Uh, we're gonna describe, describe the case. Uh, We'll open it up to you for 10 minutes to make a presentation. We just ask you to kind of stick to the facts of the variance. That's really all we can consider. Uh, any uh, any um, aspects of it that relate to the variance criteria would really help us a lot. Uh, measurable impacts, those kinds of things. 
and uh, after we've uh, uh, had your heard your presentation, we'll open up a public hearing for anyone in the audience that may have shown up to speak in favor or against your proposal. And after we're confident we've reviewed any emails or letters and public comments, we'll close the public hearing, and then we'll deliberate amongst ourselves. And then we may ask you questions, but most of that deliberation will be among the committee, and then we'll make a decision for you. Chair Galbraith, I'm um, not uniquely, but uh, especially related to this applicant, so I would like to recuse myself, All right. if I may. That's, uh, you, you sure can. All right. And that's typical of members that want to avoid any perception of conflict of interest. So. Okay, Mr. Bowman, are you ready to read them the rights? <laughs> the opening statement to the applicant. If you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Stormwater Management Committee, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of certiorari with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the committee's decision. You are advised to seek the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. Case number one on the agenda is case 2022-00009 at 50, 5420 Stonebox Lane. 5420 Stonebox Lane, APN is 160110B01600C0. Inspector is Kimberly Hayes, Council District 4, Robert Swope. Applicants request disturbance of the floodway buffers to construct a new home continuous mowing and maintenance of the floodway buffer and waiver of buffer signage. Appellant is the Pierce Family Trust represented by Devinder Sandu, Sandu Consultants International. Comments, stormwater staff. Project variance site mitigation plan includes conserving certain existing trees, 950 square feet of canopy and ground covers, invasive removals, attention to not destabilizing slopes and implementing mitigation plan, use of native species, with an overall planting schedule of 500 trees, six shrubs, 75 uh, ground cover plants. Codes, no comment provided. Planning had no comment provided. And Greenway said no comment provided. Okay, so uh, you're welcome to introduce your uh, proposed variants. I'll, uh, I'll start a clock for you. You'll have about 10 minutes, which is uh, standard by our guidelines and rules of the committee and uh, uh, and then we'll go from there so all right hello good morning are we on good yes, morning sir good morning committee members uh, my name is Devinder Sandhu residing at 1709 Ashwood Avenue I'm the engineer assisting the owner and the builder with the project to build a single family residence at 5420 stone box lane I have given you all a copy of my statement so you can follow along if you need to. Uh, the owner, Dick Pierce, the builders, uh, Dean Patel and Jack Campbell, and I thank you for your consideration of our variance request regarding the water quality buffers. This lot is part of a plat recorded as a planned unit development overlay on October 29th, 1986 in plat book 6900, page 103. The official property owner is a Pierce Family Trust, as recorded in deed uh, 2021 1025-01428470, dated October 25th, 2021. Our client, Mr. Dirk Pierce, and the builder, Jack Campbell, followed the Metro procedure to glean information about the requirements for building on this lot prior to the acquisition date of October 25, 2021. At no time during this preliminary process was there an issue, was the issue of water quality buffers broached. It was only during the building permit and the stormwater infill application process that we were told that the property is subjected to the 50 foot zone one and the 25 foot zone two buffers since the property borders a floodway defined by the preliminary flood insurance study dated April 29th, 2020, April 28th, 2021. This study is not officially adopted by Metro Nashville yet. The lot is only 100 foot wide along the west boundary. It is 162 feet long Brentwood branch. Uh, the elevation of the property, I, I don't have that on here, but ranges from uh, about 590 
along the creek to uh, 624 at the highest elevation uh, along Stone Box Lane. Uh, the top of the bank is within the common grounds and ranges from 590 to 591 as it uh, goes from east to west. The elevation along the north property line is, um, uh, is 592. That is, uh, the north property line borders the creek, okay? Per the FIS, the base flood elevation is 597.1. The floodway elevation is also the same on this side of the creek. The floodway extends to the north about 200 feet from the subject property boundary. There's a flat area on the north side uh, that extends almost all the way to the, to the road on the north. The elevation of the property along Stonebox Lane ranges from 617 to 624. This is 20 to 27 feet above the BFE and the floodway. I want to reiterate that, that we're almost 30 feet above the BFE and almost 30 feet above the top of bank. Over 90% of the property is out of the 100-year and 500-year floodplain. The zone one and zone two buffers, however, will consume the whole lot. The lowest finished floor elevation that's habitable off the house is 620. Uh, the garage is at about 618, the garage elevation. This is 23, the, the finished floor elevation is 20 feet, 23 feet above the BFE and the floodway elevation. The lowest base of the retaining wall, foundation wall is 607.5 or almost 10 feet above the BFE. The retaining wall is uh, along the parking area and also forms the foundation of the house along the north side. The owners want minimal disturbance of the lot with only the building footprint plus 10 feet to allow for construction. 19 trees with uh, the uh, diameter of breast, at breast height greater than six feet are going to be preserved. Some of those trees are almost uh, 34, 35 inches in diameter. So the, the, those canopy, the high canopy is very, is quite extensive and the, the understory is uh, pretty much shaded out. We do not anticipate disturbing any of the property beyond the silt fence, which is about 30 feet from the top of the bank and along the rear building setback line. We provided a landscape mitigation plan, which is extensive and provides excellent ground cover and understory growth that will greatly enhance the quality of the waters, of the surface water entering the creek. I want to correct uh, Logan's uh, description that we're actually only adding six trees, uh, six understory trees. Uh, we've had uh, we've had about 50. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, about 70 shrubs and the ground cover is the 300 range. We're not, ad we're not adding 300 trees to this site, Logan. There's no way <laughs> that can happen. <laughs> um, Wishful thinking. Wishful thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, we feel that this lot, as part of an ap approved development, should be granted the variances requested. Um, and I'd like to add that the other houses that are along, um, along this creek, uh, to the west of this property are all, would all encroach the 50 and this 25 foot buffer and none of those lots would be buildable. If by any chance there's a flood, a fire, uh, earthquake or tornado hitting those houses, would you allow those houses to be rebuilt? I don't know, I, I've never seen that come. I'm one of those guys who watches Channel 3 and watch you guys. <laughs> I've never seen that come up yet. What happens, what happens to a house that's been destroyed by a, by a catastrophe? Will you, would you guys allow that to be rebuilt? It's or a would mix, Metro buy that property back? It's a mixed record. Yeah. Depends on how far the new encroachment is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so this, this study, just barely the FIS, um, the flood insurance study, uh, has stopped pretty much at uh, the Pierce uh, property, and it hasn't extended beyond that yet. But um, if you look uh, on, um, well, I'll, I'll give you a map later that shows how many of these houses are impacted, um, would be impacted if this, uh, this study is adopted. 
including um, <clears throat> the house that's uh, to the north, it would be completely within the floodway. Uh, we have the support of Council Member uh, Robert Swope, our neighbors, and the HOA, including Bill Swope, the president, and uh, not Bill Swope, Bill, um, I had a... Um, Dirk Langford and, and Bill Stowe. William Bill Stowe. Stowe. William Bill Stowe, Stowe. sorry. <laughs> that little typo there. Bill Stowe is the HOA president. He is support, he's supporting this development. And uh, Dirk Langford, who is a building committee member of the HOA, is also supporting it. Um, uh, thank you. That's most of my presentation. Mr. Pierce, Mr. Campbell, and, um, and Dean Patel may have a couple of statements. And I think Councilman Swope uh, wants to verbalize his support. Uh, we are available for any comments you may have. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that uh, model example of sticking to the facts. So appreciate it. All right. So uh, at this time, we're going to open up the public hearing. Uh, is there anyone here who'd like to speak in favor or against the current proposal? If you want to come up to the mic, uh, we'll ask you to do like is tradition on Channel 3. Introduce yourself. Give us your uh, street address in Davidson County. Or, or elsewhere, and, and then uh, you'll have two minutes to share your perspective. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, my name's Jack Campbell. I've been working, uh, sorry, my name's Jack Campbell. Uh, my home is uh, 149 Lake Terrace Drive, Hendersonville, Tennessee. Uh, and I work closely with the builder, Dean Patel, and uh, I've been working with the Pierces uh, since they were first looking for a lot for this house they want to build back in, uh, uh, started in September. October. Well, we started the process yeah. in September, and then we landed landed on this lot. So I, I'm the guy that did all the initial due diligence because when, as a professional builder, the first thing we do when we look at a piece of property is go pull everything that we can find on it and uh, see what the CCNRs are and what the, the current uh, stormwater and wastewater and freshwater situations are and so forth. And in that process last fall, this wasn't an issue. Uh, it was only, as uh, Devender said, uh, but it came up as a bit of a surprise uh, in the spring when we started the actual building permitting process uh, that it was flagged. And, and my understanding is that these maps were, uh, I'm not an expert here, you guys are the expert. Somewhere in that process, these maps became germane. Uh, my take on this is for anybody that were to, drive over there and to turn into Stone Box Lane. Right as you turn into the road, what you see is a sweeping rise with a little creek down at the bottom of it. And then all the houses at the top of that rise. And when you look at it, the, the takeaway for me is that there is a huge area, acres and acres of flat land with a tiny little creek adjacent to it, and then a steep bank that goes up 30 plus feet. And we're building the house at the top of the bank where the other houses are. So the, the creek may rise five feet in a Noah epic flood, uh, but it just goes up the edge of the bank there. All the flood water goes across to the open area on the other side of the creek. So nothing is disturbed by flooding on this land. And certainly not the house, certainly not 90% of the growth along the bank, just a little bit at the bottom as it goes along. So just from a practical perspective, uh, that's my spin as a builder. I look at it and I, I think, well, there's, there's nothing I see here that uh, would trigger any kind of, uh, any, any of this. <laughs> so anyway, uh, thank you so much. All right, anybody else? Good morning, my name's Dean Patel, address 1516 Hampton Street. I'm with Unique Construction. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. 
I've dealt with, um, I've worked with actually Mr. Logan on a few stormwater developments, and it's a key thing to our city, obviously, the stormwater drainage. This site was first uh, given to me by Mr. Jack to build a house. Challenging site, but everything can be done. Um, I'd like to get the opportunity to build this house for the Pierce family. Uh, I've already did all my due diligence, just like Jack said, that this all started when I had applied for the permit and they threw a red flag when it came to stormwater. I was under the impression that everything was done. Uh, we've pretty much got majority of the sign-offs uh, apart from stormwater, but I think with the site plan that Mr. Sandu has given us and the home plan, I don't think we'll have any issues as far as the stormwater drainage, but uh, the rest of it falls new because it's in the creek area. I don't think we're going to have any issues at all but hoping to get approval for it so we can move forward with the Pierce family. Thank you again. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Council representative. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chair, committee members. Um, again, let me thank you for your service. Uh, I know we all work way too hard, especially in today's environment, but um, as you've heard from Mr. Sandu and from Jack and the Pierce family over here, this is kind of a unique situation. Um, and as I said to you last month, this is all because of the new FEMA flood, flood, floodplain lines that have been redrawn. Um, I can almost bet you that this won't be the only case like this you're going to consider across, you know, 590 miles of Davidson County. Uh, but I would ask that you support this. As you can see, there's a whole lot of support for this. Um, they just want to build a house. And to be honest with you, he, as Mr. Sandu said, the lowest point on, on any building spot on this on this lot is 23 feet vertically from the creek. Uh, it, it would take it, it would take flooding the earth for this house to ever flood. Um, so I would ask your support and beg you to grant this variance. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I have to apologize. Uh, my name is Reed Cersei. I'm a neighbor uh, on 900 Stonebox Lane, kind of down uh, down the road. Um, I I know that I got here late, so I missed probably the good part of it. Um, but as a as a neighbor, I, I'm not necessarily in uh, negativity towards them building the house. Um, I think what we care about as neighbors is just making sure that in the construction process that not a whole lot of dirt has moved. I know there's a building site that's happened not too far from it that was built on a dry dry dam that's caused several houses down the neighborhoods to flood. I don't think that we're getting into that situation here. We, as, as a neighborhood, we just care about the safety of that community and that creek. Um, and I think, it, I think it could probably be done the right way. Um, we, we just want to make sure that that process is monitored and uh, we don't want the creek to, you know, disturbed and the building process in itself is, is a messy, I actually am a real estate agent myself, so I am, I'm pro them building the house. Um, and uh, I do think that there's a big, big area there for them to build on. Uh, just want to make sure we don't disturb the creek. So I don't know if that helps or not. Thanks. Anybody else? Hello, uh, I'm Dirk Pierce, and this okay. is my wife, Maria. Uh, I'm just going to keep it short and sweet. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the as it's been stated, uh, you have an embankment, then you have a creek, and then you have another embankment, and it's just a few feet high. And if there was a massive flood, uh, that water is going to have to exit and it's going to exit out into this valley that is before us. It is um, a very big valley, and uh, it's not gonna rise up. That's all I would say. Um, happy birthday. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Any, uh, seeing that we don't have any more uh, live discussion uh, here present today, do we have any uh, emails, voicemails, letters? Uh, no documentation. No, no letters, emails, anything on this case. Okay. All right. So it sounds like we have uh, thoroughly uh, vetted all the public input, so we'll close the public hearing at this time, and we'll open it up for... Uh, 
committee uh, discussion and review. Um, I'll start off with just one question up. Um, uh, just to clarify your mitigation proposal. Now, typically, when we get a proposal like this, we're kind of considering two things. We're considering hardship as defined by the, a state appeals court decision, which says that your lot has to be some kind of hydrologic, hydrogeomorphic anomaly in the county that the original ordinance couldn't have foreseen as being affected unfairly or unduly by this ordinance or in a way that wasn't consistent with the ordinance's original sort of a purpose. You probably don't have that. We've got many lots with this kind of circumstance, you know, steep rising banks, narrow buffers, that kind of thing. So the second one is is mitigation, and 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 that one that one is purely at a sort of a discretionary basis to try to recover the function of the buffer that's being lost. So if if there's if if there is a if we don't have a flooding concern, if we don't have a first responder kind of concern, if we don't have, um, you know, significant significant habitat that's being lost, uh, we can consider mitigation as justification for offsetting the loss of the buffer area. And I'll, I'll mention one thing that sounds favorable. It it, it, it may not be completely technically appropriate, but when you have a fast rising lot, horizontal distance typically doesn't cover the the actual area of buffer that is covered by vertical distance, right? So we're just measuring horizontal distance from the edge of the stream bank across. When you have a fast rising slope, I used to have to write farm plans to spread seed on steep slopes. You got to put a lot of extra seed on steep sloping land that typically is measured horizontally on aerial photograph to cover that rising slope. So technically and figuratively, we've got a little extra room to play with here in terms of square feet of the buffer that we normally wouldn't have because the, the landscape rises so fast. So that being said, uh, um, how many how many square feet specifically are you disturbing in the zone one, and how many square feet of mitigation are you proposing to offset offset that outside the zone one in the zone two or and, and on other parts of the lot? Do you have anything near a one to one or a two to one ratio that addresses that? Um, the building footprint is about 2,500 square feet. The parking area is maybe another 500 square feet. So, so your building 3, footprint is actually in the zone one. Is zone one and zone two. And zone two. Right. And so is the parking. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I understand your, uh, your issue or your discussion about the vertical um, and the horizontal line of... Uh, <clears throat> off the buffer, but I don't think we, the buffers move that much with going along the hypotenuse as opposed to vertical and horizontal. Except along the Cumberland River, I've had that issue with um, with these guys where the Cumberland River and the BFE is 100 feet below the lot, and they're, you guys are still looking at it on a horizontal, so that something like that needs to be corrected, I think. Um, we're, we're mitigating, our mitigation plan uh, is essentially providing, going in there and removing all the invasive species that we can find and uh, doing our best to provide understory cover. The, the Pierces do not want to disturb any of the land other than where the house footprint is. They don't want to mow, they don't want to um, have a garden in the back. Um, uh, so it'll be, it'll essentially be left to nature to keep it, um, uh, to keep it. Um, That'll just be a patio deck. Yeah, there's just a deck on the back, cause that's already in there. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're actually gonna enhance what's there now. 
was there now is pretty scraggly because it is under it is understory and it's got a canopy that is just pretty Im immense and you can if you look on the photographs you can see what <coughs> I'm talking about. Okay. So I think we're enhancing we're going to enhance the water quality feature of this house uh, of this uh, lot by doing the landscape mitigation plan. Uh, we're also um, following the stormwater uh, infill requirements by um, adding, we're going to have cisterns to collect the rainwater and we can probably come up with other, other uh, 21500 gallon cisterns to collect rainwater and to release it slowly or to use it for irrigation. So, so have, um, have you considered any off-site mitigation at all, like at a public park or a mitigation bank? Or I wish you'd quit reaching in my back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I get it. I always enjoy. All right, so always enjoy uh, your your comments here because they're always really uh, straightforward. Appreciate that. May I? Uh, yes, sir. And I knew him before I knew you <laughs> as well. So, uh, Kabir. So. Thank you, sir. Okay, so um, okay, was so there anything else you wanted to say about yeah, that uh, you know, response to that uh, question? And by the way, happy birthday, and I also wanted it's, to It's not my birthday, by the way. Oh, it's not? Yeah. When is it? <laughs> it was, that was several weeks ago, and it's okay, not I relevant. Don't know why. So. Well, <laughs> Even if it was today. Sorry, it's your birthday. <laughs> yeah. today, nice, but, nice. Hey, I appreciate the gesture, so. But I, want, I, want, um, <laughs> I also want to acknowledge all the work you've done at uh, Lipscomb University for uh, uh, making that a, a green you. campus. I, I've been following you. I for, wish that was relevant, too, so, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, I mean, it's, it's good, yeah. good work that you've yeah, done. Over appreciate there. it. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. All right. All right. So this um, this uh, parcel viewer that I gave you, if you look at that outline in uh, orange, that's a common common ground, uh, common space for the HOA. Um, and if we can, uh, Logan, if we can bring up the photographs um, of the bridge and. There's a photograph of a bridge. There's a road that leads to the house. That's lot number uh, 17, I think. If you look right above my orange marking, you'll see a big house there, which is lot 17, parcel 17. If you go the other way, Logan, one more photo, please. Right there. Okay, right there. Uh, everything to the right of that picture is part of HOA, uh, right off that roadway is HOA property. That is being mowed and it is being, um, it's clear almost all the way to the, uh, to the bank, top of bank. Logan, if you go to the next photo, I think I, there's a picture looking the other way. Rebecca's right in there. Oh, I'm sorry? <laughs> who's, who's, doing, are you, who's controlling? Rebecca. 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 Sorry, Rebecca. Rebecca, control the next one for me, please. <laughs> Uh, so this is a photograph of the bridge that leads to the house uh, that's in the floodway if, that, uh, if, I, if the FIS was extended. That house and that bridge are going to be smack dab in the middle of the floodway. If you look on the, the close-up sheet I have, you can see that house. And if you visualize that floodway extending, that house, the bridge, would be in the floodway. Um, I haven't really discussed this with the HOA or with the Pierces, but um, I think if we provide mitigation between that road and the creek, we would more than offset what the house is doing. Would that be something amenable to? It's this something committee? to consider. Um, you know, the, the, the third point that I didn't address is that, you know, um, it's, um, I guess the, I guess the correct word is traditional. Uh, routine probably wouldn't be the right word, but traditionally, when we have a preliminary floodplain analysis like this going on, and people get caught in that transition, uh, if if it's a clear flood risk to the community, uh, you know we can't help it when floodplains get bigger because the community is 
hardening the landscape and creating more water, uh, causing more water runoff. We, we have to act in the interests of protecting people against flooding, protecting first responders from having to rescue people from places that we've created by variances if we're not careful. So, so we, we have to weigh that. This is a little bit different circumstance. I think our primary concern here is the water quality buffer. I, I don't think it's flooding. I, I'm seeing all the engineers shake their heads. I'm seeing staff are, are, are haven't shown us any maps. Uh, can you show us anything different than that that changes that perception? Uh, no, Chair, but I, I should note that this lot had a buffer on it before the new flood maps came out. Okay. And that buffer was likely of, of, of similar size due to the drainage area of the stream there. So it has been flagged in our system since our system went up in 2007, okay. and the buffer would have been applied in the year 2000. So where would the zone one have been before the preliminary? Would it have crossed the footprint of this house? I believe so, yes. Okay. So, you know, can anybody explain why they didn't, uh, in their vetting of, of the existing stormwater conditions, why they didn't find the zone one boundary line? I would it, like it, it would have been well established. It I would like uh, staff for the folks that we spoke with. Um, I wasn't there, but uh, Mr. Campbell uh, went and spoke to everybody following the process of seeing if this was a buildable lot. You remember it, who you talked to, Campbell. sir? Uh, I, I do not. Uh, I would, I, at this point, the first thing I thought is that that doesn't, that doesn't correlate to what we came up with in October of last year. Uh, I, uh, went through the available materials and had one uh, conversation, uh, and what we came up with was a 30-foot stream buffer at the time, prior to these maps. So, with respect, I would challenge that and ask to see some sort of documentation. You would have had one of two buffers, either a 50-foot or the 75-foot. We do apply the 75 foot to drainage areas over 640 acres, which is one square mile. And looking at the drainage, as it's shown in our GIS, I don't, you may have done another drainage calculation, but the drainage area there shows us greater than one square mile, which would have applied the, the 75 foot buffer. But I'm not sure who you talked to. I in, in fall of last year? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Did, did the previous maps have floodway mapped on this, or was it just floodplain? Didn't even have the floodplain. It didn't have that, yeah. It's, it wasn't studied. I don't even know if it was the zone. It was an unmapped area. Yes. So that's why. That's why. And, and yeah, that that's what's triggered it because if it if it didn't show floodway, then you would have assumed either a, a zone one or a zone one and two buffer on it, and it would have been thirty or sixty feet. I there could have been a platted. There could have been a platted buffer of, of different. I don't know if they have a 30 foot that was platted when they originally platted the, the lot. So it would have been a 50, is what, it, what Rebecca's saying, based on drainage area. What I noted is on the site plan, it had, I think, 44 feet from top of bank. And so under prior to the maps being issued under the new study, I would assume you'd be here for a six foot encroachment, unless that was from the rear property line rather than the top of bank. But if it were a 30-foot buffer, then yeah, they wouldn't need any variance. So yeah, that, those are my main that. questions: is what what was it prior to the pending map? So you know, our 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 first priority is protecting the resource. That's what the buffer ordinance is about. Our second one's public safety, uh, flooding, uh, protecting property downstream that properties like this can actually shed more water on. Um, so uh, this is a little more unique than situations we've had in the past. Typically when we've had a clear zone one buffer line, we've rarely granted any variance even with a with mitigation. We, we tended to be more flexible with zone twos, depending on what the encroachment is, depending on what kind of encroachment is, uh, what kind of structure, whether it be a patio or a porch, where water can go under it. Um, but with, without the floodway, they'd be well outside of a zone one. Exactly, yeah. So, uh, um, 
you know, what we don't want to do is encourage people to be uh, uh, selling property or investing property without doing proper due diligence. We have had people come here before with property they had bought sight unseen, out of state, and we've had to turn it down. Uh, if I, I just want to make sure everybody, that everybody understands that this is, um, that we've had situations where it's clear and understandable and, and we've, we've had to deny the variance. We had other situations where we've had a little, little more uh, vagueness in terms of people's uh, understanding and the opportunity to mitigate it. Um, so that, those are the uh, considerations that we've got to make today. So. If, if I may, this property was not bought sight unseen. It was, uh, they vetted it to make sure they could build on yeah, it. I, and, I understand. And, and I no, understand. Flags I, went, no flags went up yeah, from, from yeah. Metro. I understand. From I, all the different divisions until the, the building department was I understand. I, I think, I mean, I, I know ignorance is not the rule, but yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, off that, but yeah. it, the, I think the maps need to be updated that, that are available on, um, on the internet. There's, uh, it doesn't show on the internet that that I've been able to find on um, on, on on the mapper. Is there there's a button on the GIS the, the stream buffer? Yeah, it's, it's. So I'm assuming if you click that, right? But it yeah. didn't show it didn't show at that time. Right. Even the metro planning maps would they have not shown that? They don't. They don't show the, the they don't show the 50 um, they don't show the 50 foot and the 25 foot buffer. On can the you uh, maps. can you go to the metro planning? Maps, GIS maps there, and show us what they would have seen at that time. Because I, I routinely refer students to metro planning maps, and it explicitly shows buffers. Now, there's a little disclaimer on the map that says this may not be to scale, but it's, it's a pretty good warning to folks that they need to be aware of the buffer ordinance. This is all the GIS map shows. Yes, sir. Thank you. That w would that be based upon just the ordinance and not the new preliminary? See how the stream buffers. That's about what you said, isn't it's it? It's in the back of the lot. Yep. Yeah. So in that case, do you, in that case, do you think it's still about a six-foot encroachment? Well, it, it's. Uh, I'd be. I don't know what the overall depth of that lot is. It looks like they're showing just a zone one. Yeah, that's what that would normally. Two. Yeah, that's what those maps don't show zone twos. I don't think. But it, it it'll it'll show wider if it, if there is a zone two assumed. Mm -hmm. But obviously mm -hmm. this is a yeah. This is a metro planning it, map system. Yeah, I don't think it shows the floodway buffers. I think it does show the map. floodway. It does show the floodway. Yeah, that's that's what the zone one, show. right? And that would be the old line, not the preliminary. Yeah, it just doesn't show the 15 and the 25. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It does on effective maps, but not the preliminary. Okay. I see what you're saying. It doesn't show the standard ordinance buffers, what you're saying. Okay. Right. Okay. What's the uh, will of the committee? Well, what other input discussion do we have on this proposal? Well, I'm interested in hearing more about additional mitigation, if that's a possibility. You mentioned along the roadway. I'm sorry? You mentioned potential mitigation along the roadway. It's along the private drive uh, to the north, and it would be within the common area for the HOA. We haven't approached the HOA about doing any of that, but if you look at that picture there, it would be uh, the, the road belongs to the property owner of lot 17. Okay. Um, so we wouldn't be able to do anything there, but between the roadway, or possibly, I think possibly between where the telephone utility pole is to the creek, we could look at adding. Um, why do you think? Why do you think this lot hasn't developed in the past? It just uh, possibly because of the slope and the size. It's one of the smallest lots in the whole subdivision. Narrow. And uh, I, I don't know if legal can step in here on vested property rights, but when this lot, when this whole area was developed, 
Uh, I'm looking at uh, the law on, uh, on Title 13, Chapter 4, Part 3 of the Power of Municipal Planning Commission to promulgate provisions for development vesting period for development standards as an approved development plan. It says in that that the regulations that were in place at the time the development was approved is what should be um, looked at during development of lots. The time the preliminary plan, final plan, or grading or um, building permit are approved. It says and or. So um, I, I think at that time, uh, you want to look at it? No. At that time, um, it's under under B. If I may, may I read that? Is that a planning regulation or a stormwater regulation? It's a planning regulation. I, that's, I don't think that's really relevant for us today. So. It is also a state law. It's a state I'm vesting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In, in, fact, state in fact, this vested property right was um, this exact, this exact, uh, this exact law was quoted by um, in the in the case uh, for the quarry neighborhoods of Old Hickory versus uh, uh, Metro Metropolitan Government of Davidson County, August 23, 2017, um, where the neighbors, where the councilman actually introduced a bill to change, to change the zoning regulation. But because uh, they had already started the process, they hadn't done any construction yet, but because they already started the process of developing that quarry out there at Old Hickory. You guys might be familiar with that because it came before you too, I think. Um, they were, the courts went along with the quarry people because of vested property rights. Okay. So why don't we do this? Um, this is a horrible place to work out details I understand. In, the op in an open forum. You've already got a lot of time to invest in this. I, I don't think more time is going to hurt you to, to maybe come back to us with more specifics on a proposal to mitigate the area that um, uh, uh, that would offset the encroachment um, on um, in the manner that you described earlier, off, on site, I'd, 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 I hesitate to encourage you to, to evaluate it based upon what the expectation might have, get, might have been before the preliminary. Uh, we need to try to capture as much benefit and mitigation as we can. Um, I think the circumstance could warrant mitigation. Uh, there's, there appears to be some interest in that in the committee. I just don't think it'd be healthy for us to try to hash out the details right now. So would you all mind considering a deferral to go back and work out the details, get together with staff, and, and try to bring us back something that is more concrete that we can evaluate instead of if just I trying may. to hash it out here? Yes, sir. Um, my wife and I have been homeless now for a year and a half. And we're having to, we have a home in Guadalajara, Mexico. And we've been living in our home in Guadalajara, Mexico. Uh, this being here today, for which we're most grateful, it's taken almost every ounce of energy that we have to get to this point. And we're not only dealing with the fact that we have multiple storage units with all our belongings in it, but we have a builder now who has other commitments as well. We, uh, of course, I, could, uh, I don't have to mention what building costs are. Ha and so what was presented to you at one time now can become in jeopardy at this time. And so uh, I understand the desire for further mitigation. I think, though, that we've submitted a very thorough package to you folks. And I would ask uh, that we take, take a vote, if that's what we do, because we, we need to determine if we're... Um, if, if we can build a house or not. We just can't be homeless any longer. Could we do a conditional? In, in what way? Conditional approval? That we come up with a mitigation plan you guys approve? We, we've, we've tried to get away from that. Um, 
uh, it, it'll probably bring you back here anyway if there's any disagreement on that conditional uh, could it be uh, work with staff could it be type something proposal. staff could approve? It, it could be, but uh, I've, I've got a feeling that staff probably wouldn't approve it without a clear decision from the committee. Anything from legal on vested property rights? Now, Mike? I, I was just able to pull it up. Um, it, is a, it is a complicated act. Um, the vesting period is, the main part of it says, a vested, there's a lot of exceptions and it's convoluted, but a vested property right shall be established with respect to any property upon the approval by the local government in which the property is situated of a preliminary development plan or a final development plan where no preliminary development plan is required by ordinance or regulation or a building permit allowing construction of a building where there was no need for prior approval of preliminary de development plan for the property on which the building will be constructed. During the vesting period, which is later described as three years, um, <clears throat> the locally adopted development standards, which are in effect on the dates of the approval of the preliminary development plan or the date of approval of the building permit, shall remain the development standards applicable to that property or building during the vesting period. So, I mean, I, to be honest with you, it's not. I'm not sure it I understand is, the facts very well murky. to know if that applies. And that, and I agree with you. It's very murky, but I think the court would side, if you, if you look at the Old Hickory, neighbors of Old Hickory at the, at the quarry, if that's used as precedent, you, they might side with the Pierces on this one. The courts may <laughs> side, side with the Pierces and, on this and one. And you're not the first to come here and assert that, frankly, that type of position. So it, we hear that. We hear those kinds of assertions a lot. And we don't want to go that route. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And and it's talking about time consuming. So, uh, so Michael, do you want to? You want to? I see your I see your wheels turning in, uh, turning over there. Do you want to weigh in on a conditional approval that you sure. that we work out with staff? But uh, I can speak to the mitigation, which to me is all that's at play here. Exactly. There is a floodplain involved. We are obligated when we become aware of facts, showing that the modeling does indicate a floodplain, not just for the to be residents, but to the second and third and fourth generation to be residents to implement those regs. We've seen a lot of local incidents where people have unfortunately been impacted. So we want to be protective of the community. In this case, this is a stream. The buffer was in effect. It's in effect in a different way now, given this preliminary. I think to me, when I look at this, it's all about what is up on the screen now. Is the mitigation adequate? I can speak for myself when I looked over this and I have to take responsibility for the bad numbers because I was the one that looked over the plan. <laughs> and somehow, Miss, Miss uh, I, I need these a lot more than what I used to. Um, I, I think when you look at a site like this as far as mitigation and, and what one needs to do, it's a mature site. You want to try to keep what you can keep. You want to be respective of the slope because we certainly don't want any future landslides that might impact the investment. Um, to me, there was significant mitigation provided on this. Uh, I do think when you start looking at mitigation off-site, there are some things outside of all of our controls as far as what you're looking at. So in the interest, if you just wish to look at this case on its own merits, and is this mitigation, uh, you know, thoughtful and contemplative, I can say at least I found it to be a good faith effort toward <clears throat> mitigation. Um, that, that's really what's at play here. I might offer an additional suggestion that you certainly wouldn't want water going off the side of that to perhaps cut that buffer over time and create issues, uh, but that would be what, what I would offer. And for the sake of all the things that you have mentioned, complicating it with staff conditionals or off-site where you would be dependent on third parties entering into this, so that, that would be my comment. Because the HOA technically doesn't own the property. They just govern private property, correct? The HOA owns the property um, 
that's common area. outlined in orange yeah. there. Okay, so that is I common the, areas. Uh, the, so they would have to get agreements. My understanding would be that the whole HOA would have to agree. They'd to probably have to vote on it, but any, then nobody anything in nobody that maintains it right now. But here, here's my concern: you're going to harden the site. The site's covered in trees now, and it would be really nice if you could offset the amount of area that you're hardening with additional plantings. Mm -hmm. That's may just I, may I yeah, speak yeah. to that and kind of give you a summary of, of my thoughts on it. Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. I, I know in times past. You know, I don't feel like we can blame them for ignorance because they did go through the right protocol. Yep. They're, they're victim of a new floodway being established. You know, staff probably gave you the, the feedback they did based on the GIS that, that shows a 30-foot buffer, uh, what appears to be that. You know, my concerns are, well, I know that they're doing everything they can the site they have, mitigation-wise. They're out of room. It's a small site. The concerns I have is there's a reason it was mapped with new floodway. So the mitigation in my mind is not really more planting. I mean, they're planting as much as they can. The, the real problem is the infill regs we have are a Band-Aid and they don't truly detain the increased runoff. I mean, they're little French drains, you know, 500 gallons of, of cisterns. I would rather say to go above and beyond as far as mitigation is you know, can could you do a pre versus post calculation, you know, through a 10 year storm to show no increase in runoff? And that way we know that nobody downstream is being impacted. And, and there's probably some ways that you could just hold back some of the roof water um, to get there. I mean, the, when you try to model smaller sites up to bigger storms, it just doesn't work well. I mean, can't, that's what Bell Mead requires. Can't, can't harvest it. Is, it. Yeah. Well, the, the programs we use explode. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so well, that's yeah. why I'm saying a, not a small smaller storm sites. is probably appropriate. And I don't know. I mean, we've got a huge elevated parking area. So as long as the water doesn't impact the retaining wall design, I mean, you got a lot of volume that you could pipe a lot of water to and then discharge it. Um, so I don't think that the site can't, couldn't support a, a design for detention, but uh, I would I would just be concerned with the discharge. You don't even with the cisterns that were shown a concentrated discharge reeling out that hill. We need more of a, a way a level spreader, a way to turn it into a sheet flow. Yeah, and I think there's ways to do that with just like a horizontal perforated pipe or you know something you could hide with landscaping, but just sits on the surface. And so if that's something that you would consider, I know that that would probably get my support just because I feel like you did do what you were supposed to do. And you didn't know that this area was even being studied. But I mean, part of the advantage of having uh, a buffer that is this steep and rises this fast remain a buffer is that it continues to be spongy. It just, it continues to sponge up water. So what he's talking about is, we, we got to figure out a way to offset that extra runoff that you're creating that the buffer was protecting us against. Uh, we do have capacity underneath the parking area. We could probably put a um, couple of uh, 1,500 gallon tanks in there. And so can we, run the question is, can we that. quantify it today or can we ask him to come I, back? I would say that, that the stormwater design shall meet preverse post flows on a 10 year storm event would be the. Could you accept that? Is that something that you think you can incorporate? As part of the conditional approval? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a condition yes, to the sir. approval. That's and then, a condition to the approval. Yeah, you know, they said they don't want to mow and maintain. I know that was in here, so we could strip the mow and maintain out. Yeah. And, uh, and then I, in, instead of, they also asked for no buffer signage. I think it might be helpful to add a buffer sign in the HOA area that would more educate people because nobody's going to see the buffer sign in their backyard. Yeah, yeah we, we, tip, we typically encourage people to use a landscape boundary and, and give you relief on, the, on private residential signage just because it can tend to be really ugly or obtrusive. But in more commercial areas or HOA areas, we tend to be very consistent about requiring signage that is really obvious. So, uh, so does all that sound amenable to you before I go to council and get her in my, in my side eye here? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. All right. So, yes. council, does that sound okay, Mike? Yes. I, I would just offer you might want to put some language contingent upon getting the HOA to agree to the signage. Oh, definitely. Sure. Oh, that definitely. would be Absolutely. outside yeah. of their control. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, with regard to the HOA mitigation issue, um, 
I mean, the HOA board is going to change over time, so I'm sure we want the mitigation to have, you know, ensured survivability. So if they were to, like a future board were to change their mind, you might want something recorded um, that would require them to keep the mitigation in place. Okay. Yeah. Um, an easement or a covenant of um, real, real covenant, something like that. If you can't get it on site, they might be able to get it off site. <clears throat> That's kind of what we're talking about now. I know it's right. That that was that was a, just where more someone would be able to see it. Um, I, I had something else to add as well, just a clarification on the Vested Property Rights Act, if that's okay. Um, so I looked up the, the definition of the phrase development standards as used in that um, state law and says it means all locally adopted or enforced standards, regulations, or guidelines applicable to development of property, including but not limited to planning, local stormwater requirements, layout design, local construction standards for buildings, streets, alleys, curbs, sidewalks, zoning as provided for um, in a previous section, lot size, lot configuration, yard dimensions, and off-site improvements, including public or private infrastructure in which an applicant may, requ may acquire vested rights or vested property rights according to this section, but does not include standards required by federal or state law. So I'm wondering here if what changed was not a local development standard, but the state the, or the federal mapping. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Which, yeah. which in turn, it's still the local preliminary. standards are based on. Yeah. So it's yeah. a local standard that was implemented versus now we have a buffer from a floodway instead yeah. of a buffer we're, from a stream bank. Yeah. We're, I mean, but the, the local standard actually hasn't changed. Like the application of it has changed because the federal map has changed. We're not going to resolve that today. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's, 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 I love the phrase quasi-judicial because it keeps us out of all kind of trouble. <laughs> okay. okay, so uh, so it sounds like uh, we're going to try to give you an empirical way to make sure your neighbors are not receiving extra water, at least for a 10-year storm event. And uh, we're going to... The reality is residential drainage. I mean, the gutter system would... Anything higher than that won't ever make it to the detention system. So it's yeah, that's my that's my criticism of, of detention. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's why I support bioretention, infiltration, paving, and that kind of thing. So anyway, um, uh, uh, thank you for helping me make that point to my students who are listening. So um, so it sounds like we got a variety of conditions that are empirically driven that are going to give us some assurance, protect the neighborhood to the best extent possible, and deal with this very unique case. I, I, I don't think we're going to see this a lot. Hopefully people learn from this kind of circumstance. If we do see it a lot, some people are going to get stuck with it because we've got to protect the community. So, um, so in this case, we're, we're trying to work with you and we're trying to protect your neighbors and the resource too. Okay. All right. So do we have a motion? <laughs> well, yeah. you know, um, first dog to bark. <laughs> I have a motion to approve with the condition of 10-year storm, uh, storm analysis to provide pre and post detention. Um, or retention, yeah. yeah. Retention. Um, and we will not approve the mowing, uh, mowing and maintaining of the buffer yard and there needs to demonstrate a good faith effort to provide some sort of buffer signage, um, either you know, in view of the public, where it's not just seen on private property, either that with the HOA or on site. And, and that sign can be approved by staff. And uh, deed, um, and if it's only the sign that is going to be offsite, I mean, a, a board could remove it in future. Is it just? I mean, I would say it'd be simpler just to put it on their property. Nobody well, will ever see it. I didn't yeah. see a lot of value in that. Yeah. We're at risk of it being removed in the future, but you know, a kid could come and swing on it and rip it down, or you know, who knows. But chair, may I? Technically, the buffer doesn't exist on the other property that you're proposing putting the buffer sign on, so it might just lead to confusion. Uh, because the map, the mapping ended. Yeah. It, it should be there. No. Well, buffers, buffers are only applied when, when a parcel undergoes development, and yeah. that other parcel is not undergoing development. So, and That's true. But, I mean, our, our goal is to 
offset the runoff as close to the site as possible if you can't get it on site. And, but to do it in a way that will be there in perpetuity. So what's the instrument that would help us get there? I mean, is it possible to place a sign at the edge of their property, like facing outwards or something like that? I, don't, I really don't know. I'm it just identifies up. the creek. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the stone box lane runs along the property. If you look at, uh, at the drawing there, it comes down yeah, to the right. Yeah, you could put it at the, the corner. Sign, a sign could be, be put along from the, the road. Yeah. Along yeah, the stone box lane. Y'all have, y all have southeast, The southeast corner of the lot is where the little bridge is yeah. that's at street level, yeah. and that would be an ideal place for a sign that the public could see, and it would also not be particularly intrusive to the homeowner either. It would okay. be a great yeah. Y'all okay with that? Okay. All right. Notice I was looking at the Ms. Ms. owner there that time. So. It's <laughs> been a year and a half of a lot of stress. So. <laughs> okay, that's all right. So I'm trying to make sure everybody leaves reasonably okay. So, all right. So you want to restate your motion since you, so we, we didn't get through it? We we have th there were three requests. I make a uh, so I make a motion to approve the encroachment into the stream buffer. Um, with the condition that you provide storm analysis for a 10-year design. Uh, we disapprove the mowing and maintenance uh, of the buffer, and we disapprove the request to not have a sign, and that one sign would be required rather than a sign every set distance as the regulations state. Which we've done before. And uh, anything related to HOA off-site mitigation? If, if, if it can fit on site, I don't think that's necessary. Okay. Do, right. I don't know right. if we need to vote on those in three separate votes or if they can be I collected. think you have the flexibility to go off-site by virtue of the empirical analysis. So if, you know, we there's plenty of, been plenty of statements on record saying that's an option for you that we concur with and we approve. So, all right, so we have a motion. But only if the HOA. HOA agrees on for that okay. on their property. Okay. Right. Yeah. All right. All right. Any questions about the motion? Any other discussions? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Do we have a second? Second. All right. We've got a motion made and a second. Any other discussion on the motion as articulated and seconded? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Thank you. I didn't open up a can of worms, I hope. <laughs> we'll see. It's always been open. <laughs> we, we live in a can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But you're, you're, you're the best one to do it, so. <laughs> that I know. Thank you, everybody. Right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, have our next applicants come forward. Well, we're gonna we're gonna read you your rights. If you haven't heard them, just want to encourage members of the public to do their due diligence. Chairman, I need to recuse myself. Okay, did you gentlemen hear your legal rights earlier? Okay. Yes, sir. All right. So uh, is there anyone here from Metro uh, <laughs> representing Metro? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Aaron it, okay. All right. So you know, you probably heard the routine, but just for the record, um, we're going to introduce the case. Staff's going to remind us of what the details of the variance requests are. Uh, we're going to give you 10 minutes to present your uh, summation of, of why you feel like you have either hardship or other, other aspects to address uh, concerning the variance. I ask you to stick to the facts. Uh, and um, then uh, uh, we're going to open a public hearing for anyone who wants to speak for or against uh, the proposal. <clears throat> Look for emails, voicemails, all the other stuff. Close the public hearing once we've heard everyone's input, and then we'll begin a debate amongst ourselves. We'll probably come back to you with questions. So if you'll start after the introduction by introducing each of your experts there, that way we'll know who we're talking to and who we can ask questions to. Yes, sir. All right. So Mr. Bowman. 
Case number two on the agenda is case 2022-00010, Dry Creek Flood Wall to preliminary variance. At 61 Edenwald Road, APN is 034-1100-2400. Inspector is Catherine O'Hara, Council District 10, Zach Young. Uh, applicants request disturbance of the floodway buffer of Dry Creek and Grizzard Creek for construction of a flood wall and stream relocation. Continuous mowing and maintenance of the floodway buffer, waiver of buffer signage <coughs> where necessary, and modified buffer signage where possible. Uncompensated fill in the floodplain. Appellant is Metro Water Services, represented by Aaron Thomas, Metro Water Services. Comments, stormwater staff, this project variance site mitigation plan includes over 1,700 live stake and two inch DBH tree installations. Codes, no comment provided. Planning had no comment provided and Greenways had no comment provided. Okay, so I'll start your clock and uh, if you get close to time, I'll give you like a two or a one. Just to let you know you're close. Thank okay. you, sir. Uh, I'm Clayton Foster with Barge Design Solution. This is Adrian Ward, who is our design lead and Aaron Thomas with Metro Water. Uh, we're here to talk about the Dry Creek uh, flood mitigation project. I uh, guess to your point, this is a large complex project, so I apologize, I might speak a little quickly because there's a lot to cover. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, probably just skip on through this, but a brief agenda of what we're gonna do. Um, just to remind everybody, this project came out of the May 2010 flood, which caused significant damage to the uh, facility. During the flood event, nearly 14 inches of rain fell over two consecutive days, resulting in a maximum flood elevation of the plan of approximately 435 feet. Uh, the majority of the site, as you see on this photo, lies underneath that flood mitigate, underneath that flood, and so it almost completely inundated the site. Uh, you can see some of the facilities' um, finished floor elevations were covered in 10 feet of water. Um, so going on to the next slide. Um, the plant was down for 30 days um, after this flood event. Uh, there was $4 million in equipment damages. And uh, you can click through, sorry, I should have removed these. Uh, there was over 1 billion gallons of wastewater that overflowed during that 30 days that it was down. So there's quite a bit of um, community impact here. So to go to the next slide, just to kind of Recap why we're here. We're designing a flood mitigation system to protect this critical facility from future flood events. We'll ensure the health and safety of the community by hopefully, uh, by, by protecting and eliminating those overflows that can occur during those events. So to get into the design of it, uh, we're designing a flood wall to the 500 year riverine event plus two feet, which is to meet Metro codes. Uh, Metro codes has uh, all electrical equipment needs to, for facilities such as this need to be elevated uh, um, need to be protected to the 500 year plus two event. Um, and so that's how we got to there, which equates to an elevation of 439 feet. Um, we also did an analysis of a 500 year rainfall event inside the facility. And so some of the mitigation that came from there. Um, going to the next slide, just want to discuss the overall site and some of the hardships that the site itself contains. As you can see, there's Dry Creek to the south. There's Grizzard Creek. It, it's an encapsulated stream to the right. Um, you can kind of see its mouth over there by the three circles on the lower center of the page right through there where the character is. The Cumberland River as well as the CSX Railroad to the north. So three sites are, three, three sides are completely contained here where we are. Um, we cannot just raise the buildings because there are tunnels with electrical equi equipment in them as well as pumps and things that can't be elevated to meet the requirements of the Metro code. Um, there's also many communities, Ridgetop, White House, Millersville, Hendersonville, and Old Hickory, which send their wastewater to this site for treatment. When the plant is down, every one of these communities is affected. So it's not just a Nashville concern, it affects even some of the outlying communities from here. Um, so next slide. Um, so our original plan uh, was to install a sheet pile flood wall um, very tightly around the site using some of the existing structures and um, trying to minimize as much as we can. So as we got into design, um, we realized that on the south side where Dry Creek is, it's a heavily eroded creek um, that is, Metro was already aware of an existing issue where the creek is eroding to the point that they were gonna to need to protect even their existing facilities that are here. Uh, on the north side, as we got into the geotechnical report, 
uh, their shallow rock and to meet the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers requirements for a sheet pile flood wall, you have to extend two and a half times the height into the ground with shallow rock and some of the depths on the north side going up as high as 18 feet, that wasn't going to be attainable. Uh, so in similar issues on the south side with um, sheet piling were when we talked to sheet piling manufacturers, they do not extend wall heights above eight feet. Um, and a cantilevered, we couldn't do a more advanced like a, uh, foundation or, or sheet pile, like battered, battered uh, foundation system to protect it because of the existing facilities. And so we had to start looking at some different materials, which led us to looking at a concrete flood wall. If you go to the next slide, it kind of shows some of the contours that you can see some of those extreme drops that we were trying to deal with to protect this facility. Um, but the problem with a concrete flood wall under this arrangement is you got to have a footer on each side to support the wall. With the existing erosion, we didn't want our, the creek to continue to erode and undermine our system. A lot of why I'm walking through this is to show that we're trying to maintain as minimal impact on the creek as we could, but as we kept going farther into design with some of these, it forced us to continue to look at other alternatives. Um, so the two to one slope, the one to one slope over on Grizzard Creek, we're, gonna, we're causing us concerns that if we put in a concrete flood wall, the foundation would erode and ultimately our system would not prevail. Um, so next slide just kind of shows some of the, these are, there were two cross sections that the Army Corps of Engineers had on Dry Creek. Um, to try to protect it, we looked at trying to armor the, uh, the bank to protect it from eroding. They, the problem with this is, as you can see with the heights that we were talking about, even going in an aggressive two to one slope, you are gonna fill up the creek in the bottom. Um, so that, we, we began talking to Metro about, you know, there is the option that we try to move we, we can do this option, but we're gonna need to relocate the creek, which isn't going to be in the best interest of the creek. Um, it, you know, it, there's gonna be a lot of stream impacts and uh, we wanted to better the creek. And so that led us to what our ultimate design was um, that we're proposing for you all to see is on the next slide, is to relocate those two creeks to a natural stream design, which will help improve stream quality um, for those creeks, as well as help prevent um, allow us to install this concrete flood wall and, um, ma and make sure that it doesn't in the future erode and undermine underneath it. Um, uh, we're using the existing channel of the existing structures. We're following on the north side the uh, right of way and, and, and trying to maintain as close of a proximity that we can to the existing infrastructure. Um, on the next slide, um, just there was, as I mentioned, don't think you'll need to see everything, but there are internal flood mitigation efforts that we're having to do to protect those from the 500 year uh, flood event because there will be some localized ponding in here. So putting in some watertight doors, uh, new walls um, to, to create some berms and some canopies over some structures just to make the stormwater go to where it needs to go. Uh, so I guess the next slide will show you why we're here and I can discuss a little bit about um, the, can, and you can probably just go through them. There's three of these down through. Yeah, so I apologize. The 30,000 cubic yards should be 40,000 cubic yards. That was a, um, which I believe, which was in the variance application, but that was just a mishit of the computer. Um, so we're asking for uncompensated fill, stream disturbance of the stream buffer, and continuous maintenance uh, for mowing. And so to kind of walk down through those, I think trying to walk through the design, we're trying to ask for as minim the minimum necessary to protect this critical facility. We can't move this facility from uh, where it's located. It's always going to be located at a low spot. So we you could move it to a different location on a creek, but or on the river, but it's still going to be along the river and need protection. So we there's. Uh, the minute we're doing the mission um, minimum necessary to help pr prove good and sufficient cause to protect a water reclamation facility, which is for the entire community. When in one billion gallons of wastewater overflows, that affects everyone. That's not just a local, uh, an individual problem. Um, so that's also kind of the exceptional hardship uh, with the location that it's in, as well as with um, a billion gallons overflowing during that last flood event and the more, more common flooding events that we're seeing, um, there's a need to protect this facility. And then in terms of a no rise, we have completed a no rise on, as a part of the project and we're working through that clomer process with the US Army Corps of Engineers. And as of right now, that's showing no rise um, and no impacts from us doing this, uh, 
this facility. So that's um, those are what we're needing. And in terms of our mitigation, as Logan uh, mentioned, we are uh, on the next slide. Uh, we're adding in. Um, 1,400 live stakes and 322-inch caliper trees as a part of ours. Uh, we're limited so, um, due to existing infrastructure needing to prevent root intrusion on our wall. Uh, so that's the reason for continuous mowing. Yes, sir. Just a minute. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. And then, um, so um, we are... Um, so we're doing where we're planting as many trees as we can with the available space that we have, knowing that there's existing infrastructure that we need to have. Uh, we can't have root intrusion on. On the next slide is all of our corn, all the permits that we're going to be required to get as a part of this project with the location and everything like this. And so one of my question, one of our questions for the committee is where, how, how, how what do we need to have in order? To, to come back before you in terms of these permits in order to get get a, hopefully get approval. And uh, so the next slide is questions. Okay, thanks, sir. Thanks for staying within your time. Thanks for giving us a really thorough uh, understanding of the situation. I want to particularly thank Metro for you know being a good model participant in the process that everybody else has to go through. So. All right. Is there anybody here from the public that wants to speak in favor or against the uh, current proposal? Uh, wastewater treatment's a very exciting topic, so, okay. <laughs> All right. Any letters, emails, voicemails, cartoons? <laughs> no, no letters, emails, voicemails. <laughs> okay. Yeah, newspapers don't do that like they used to, do they? <laughs> All right. So uh, we don't have any public input on this uh, today, so um, we'll close the public hearing, open it up for committee discussion and review. Um, I guess the first question I've got is, uh, you gave us mitigation for the stream relocation. Uh, are you offering any mitigation for the uh, uncompensated fill? Our plan is is to, with the 40,000, we are trying to cut out as much as we can with the stream design and remove that. We're limited somewhat on the south side because there's high rock. It, uh, where we're uh, moving the creek, it raises about 15 to 20 feet um, within that 50 feet that we're, we're looking at relocating it. And so that's, um, that's causing some of our issue with trying to, to mitigate some of that uncompensated fill from the flood wall that we would like, we, that was our initial plan was to, to do that, but um, I guess I'll let Adrian maybe speak more on that. Well, so the uncompensated fill is just, it's not fill that's being placed in the floodplain, it's just there because we're putting a flood wall around where water was being stored inside the plant. So we're not, we're not losing floodplain storage. You are. Well, we're but losing floodplain storage, okay. but it's because it's not being stored inside the plant. Is, is so that, I, I, I I would if if they have a no rise and FEMA's good with it, the the concern I've got is putting an exact number on it because I've been on the other side of this before where they, there was some survey bus or there was something and the last thing we want is them coming back for another 500 cubic yards of <laughs> fill later. Mm -hmm. So was, I, I would rather than trying to put a cubic yardage on it, you can work through FEMA with that. I would rather just say that, you know, the as-built would demonstrate that the retaining wall is two feet higher than the 500 year and not worry about the actual volumes as far as we're concerned. But I don't know if that... Well, the no-rise is the test, right? But yeah, as long as the no-rise is there, that was my big concern until you mentioned it. So since this is a preliminary, and just to remind everybody here, our, our role here is to, is to give them either a green light, yellow light, or red light as they proceed, it's not a variance approval, it's it's a preliminary sort of, this is what you should go forward with to, to, um, to give us better information, to give you more confidence that you're going down the right path. We'll of course have to consider the actual variance proposal later, but this is our best chance to make sure they come back to us with the best possible proposal. Really, this is the best thing that could have happened to that creek, because it's going to get rebuilt and restored, and it's in horrible shape. Past the questions, there's two photos of the creek that kind of show the erosion. 
I don't know if those will, but mm. you know, there's one more after it. Just kind of show the extents. It's, it's hard to see on the photo, but there's a fence line right at the top of that, that bank, and that's the wastewater treatment plant. So uh, it's substantial, and you can see that's the erosion we were concerned about eroding in, underneath in, and undermining the... 18-foot wall, you're going to... I don't know how big is your footer. Like, Eight foot on each side. Yeah, that's... And that seems compact. Yeah. <laughs> CDM is the H and H sub, and so they, Cumberland River is the one with the no rise. Um, the Clomer Lomer process is required on Dry Creek, not from a, a rise standpoint, but from a standpoint that we're physically moving the stream, so the flood well have to follow it. But it, it's showing a reduction as well. So. Okay. Yeah. If you can just come back with all those numbers, that a little more empirical understanding of what's going on. And just, you know, for the benefit of the public, you know, we were, we were talking earlier about keeping our landscape as spongy as we can. That's a good example of what happens when you harden your watersheds in Nashville. You, you're gonna, streams are gonna degrade, the stream banks are gonna get steeper because the bottom of the channel is dropping. And when it hits rock, then the, then the channel starts widening and it, it makes those nice smooth slopes go vertical. So uh, more runoff means more erosion. So, and now we're having to fix it uh, in this design. So it's an off-site impact with an on-site expensive solution. So, but it'll be better. All right, any other preliminary guidance that would help these folks uh, come back to us with a better? What were the other components outside of the stream relocation? We've talked about that and how we'd like to see a no-rise from FEMA. What's, let's talk about the other pieces. How, how, how many points are we talking about? Two, three? So there's the stream relocation, and then what about on the other side? So we've got, uh, you're talking about for our impacts, we've got the stream relocation. With the stream relocation, we're we'll having to relocate some existing infrastructure of, uh, there's a 42 inch, 30 inch sewer, so we're relocating those, and then having the flood wall are our three, I guess, items for the um, variance. You go back to the plan and show us where the sewer relocation extents would occur. You can see it in the bottom left. You can see that that line, uh, ah. the darker line that's there. There's also a similar. You can kind of see it cutting across, like the Grizzard Creek, where there's the cod on the right. If you look four or five inches above, it's kind of at an angle um, through there. And so we're going to be, those are 60-year-old sewers um, that were installed, uh, and so we're going to be replacing those uh, all the way into the influent channel to help with those crossings. And okay. Okay. How many projects have you all worked on before this one of this nature? So we did a Macquarie Creek um, pump station back in 2016. Uh, came before y'all then for something similar. It came out of the 2010 flood. Uh, so that was one. We've done a few outside of Nashville, but that's, I guess we did a Park Central project. Um, in, in Nashville. In Nashville. Of this kind, flood-proofed hospitals, which would be very similar situation along a, along a flooded stream. Opryland would be similar in a sense. So we've done a few. This is the stuff of pure excitement for an engineer, right? Well, they do have to stamp it, don't they? <laughs> There's a little bit of a little bit of stress in that. <laughs> All right, well, it's a cool project. Yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, you know, it's a highly unappreciated part of civic life. Mm -hmm. You know, this kind of this kind of work and this kind of talent. Appreciate y'all uh, serving your community. And Yes, sir. It, Metro, want to make any comments? Yes, we we did have a question. Obviously, timeline and trying to all these moving parts. I think we're hitting every governmental agency that exists, um, and I'm sure we'll find some more um, as we move through this project. But just what requirements um, that y'all want to see? So I know that you mentioned the Clomar and and getting that finalized before we come back to you. But that way we kind of have an idea on what permits you want us to have in hand before we come back. Uh, for y'all's decision. You know, just to be consistent and to be fair to other applicants, we typically ask for all your permits. Okay. 
Yeah. And it helps if you bring correspondence from the actual federal reviewer of the permit if there's any questions about anything or any doubts about things or any debate about things so we just kind of understand, you know, if, if, if there's some type of variance issue that, that we have to weigh in on that's related to a federal regulator or a state regulator's concerns, you know, the more information you can bring us, the better. And it's, it's a really bad idea just to say so-and-so said or we were told this, just bring it in writing, bring an email, bring the letters of permit approvals, all that stuff. So, yeah, that, we'll get those to Logan. Yeah. That, that being said, if, if there, those processes take so long, this is so critical around certain time frames, I would hate for us to push them into a rainy season when this flood wall can really protect something if they're, as long as they're far along in those processes, but, this is a little different from. But don't the permits do the same thing? They can't. They, they can't, have to wait on those. They, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the same thing. So, yeah. I mean, that's the permits are the greatest certainty of, of moving forward, right? The variance is just making sure all that's in when, place. Yeah. When's your plan to start, given all things turn out well? Uh, well, that that would definitely be a question for FEMA. Um, we've been in this process since 2010, um, and they originally said they would not look at our scope changes until we get 100% design. And so um, we are in the process of meeting with them. Um, and so that's there's a huge uncertainty into, uh, we thought we are going to start construction next year. Well, we're, we're going to take a vote on the preliminary, and, and if we need to add any additional language to the preliminary approval to give them a leg up with FEMA and, and the, the other regulators, we'll be glad to do that. So, I mean, I, I'm not hearing any, anybody say anything that is a significant concern given the realities that you're dealing with. And we typically give public works projects a little more leeway because they're so rare. It's not like we're building one of these every year, every day in Nashville, right? Okay. All right. So there's not a phased approach to the permitting and construction of this. This is all going to be one time. That's what we're currently moving towards. It, it may lend itself that way with the north side, you know, the north side being able to proceed because it's out right. a lot of this, but the general feeling is that we're going to get this all packaged and, and gone together. Okay. So, so to be fair to Jay, do we have another person willing to make a motion? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll make a motion to um, approve the preliminary plan as shown and presented today uh, with the condition that the um, um, all permits necessary for this get approved prior to revisiting us here at the Stormwater Management Committee. All right. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Everybody understand the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. Hopefully that can help you push FEMA to be like, look, we have to have you. Right. <laughs> and that's why I asked the question. I, I didn't want say to there was to, no uh, debate. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, if okay. you know anyone, we petition you to make your phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why they pay you the big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Roger Lindsay knows people. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for showing up. Yeah, excellent presentation. Good, good role model for others. Yeah. Pay attention to that, applicants watching on TV. <laughs> Your um, protege. Yeah, they're in the our water. Yeah, we all work right there. Okay, so that takes care of all of our variance business today. Thank you, Ms. Stokes, for recusing yourself. Oh. I guess thanks for sticking around. <laughs> it's called moral support for the pain we all go through. All right, so uh, uh, I, th I think we're going to have Roger come up and tell us a little bit about the flooding in Kentucky, just so we can kind of understand all these storm events that are occurring in our region. And um, uh, just going to add that um, Roger and I are going to potentially be on one of the local TV talk shows in the next couple of weeks to talk about climate change and its effect on our summer oh, weather okay. and we're going to try to focus on, yeah. on flooding uh, particularly because of the Kentucky circumstance and uh, of course we'll probably be asked about other aspects of that as well but uh, 
So we'll let y'all know specifically when that is, if y'all want to show up at the studio and be our groupies. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't get much better than that. You know? <laughs> so, all right. Okay. Thanks, sir. So when, when Dodd and I talked last week <clears throat> about the extreme weather events last, uh, last week in Kentucky and St. Louis, um, I knew I had, I had given y'all information previous, previously, and so it turns out it was just last September. Uh, so it's been less than a year that I did kind of a full presentation about extreme weather events in Tennessee. And I really talked a lot about a lot of extreme events all over predominantly the southeast part of the United States. We talked a lot about atmospheric rivers and the kinds of things that they experience in California. And now that we know that our 2010 flood was an atmospheric river, and we know that the event that occurred in, Mar in uh, March of 2021, just last year, was also an atmospheric river. We do know that the storm that occurred that caused such damage in McEwen and thus and then Waverly uh, was not an atmospheric river. And there, there's a lot of interesting um, description of, of what those weather systems look like. And, and in, in recent years, I've, I've developed kind of a professional relationship with, um, with a, a Dr. Uh, Carrie Talbot, who's the head of, of one of the uh, Corps of Engineers Erdic uh, sections down in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And I always say that us old timers, we refer to that as the old waterways experiment station. It's now Erdic Engineering and Research Development Center, and um, which is a, a major component of of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers um, operation. So I just, I stripped about 40 slides out of the presentation and I added some more that relate to what happened in St. Louis and Kentucky last week. So when we look at that, um, these are some of the, the headlines. The Washington Post seems to do a reasonably good job of, of, of very dramatically describing these events. And so this was, you know, a headline um, from 2017, Houston is experiencing its third 500-year flood in three years. How is that possible? And then there was um, a historic Maryland town hit by second devastating flood since 2016. Uh, of course, this was Ellicott City, and within a span of about two years, they had two 1,000-year events in Ellicott City that really caused some horrendous damage. Uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa braces for second biggest river flood on record. Um, that's 2000 and, um, 2016. My, I've, I've got new contacts coming in the, in the <laughs> mail, but... So just in 2016, and we know, of course, we know that Cedar Rapids had a major event in 2008 because we called Cedar Rapids when we were trying to figure out what to, what to do with our flood in 2010. And so they've had two major events. Um, and then Louisiana, uh, Washington Post again, state of emergency in Louisiana as the atmospheric river unloads disastrous rains. Uh, and you can see from the color coding of this event that occurred in northern Louisiana. This was, this was in the spring of 2016. Um, they had a monstrous flood in the northern half of the state of Louisiana, and then in the fall of 2016, they had an, an even worse uh, flood event in the southern half of the state of Louisiana. But you can see that they're all the way up into the, the highest ranges of, of the amount of water that floods that flows um, as, as a result of those, those events. Um, and we talked about, you know, famous last words, at least we'll never see another flood like this in my lifetime. <laughs> um, and then we, we had other events in Nashville, August of 2013. This was along Ewing Creek in North Nashville. It flooded Briley Parkway. Um, and then the events, uh, this was in Murray County uh, in 2015, a, a, a rain event that, that had some uh, nine plus inches of rain in the middle of the, the, the red portion of that color coding of that map. Um, the remnants of Harvey storm that we, as we refer to it, uh, all this purple zone up above, you know, it affected mostly the northern part of the city of Nashville and then counties uh, beyond to the north of, of us. Um, you know, rain events upwards of 10 and 11 inches that occurred over that, you know, August the 30th through September the 2nd of 2017. 
Um, then we had February of 2019. That wasn't a specific storm event, but it was the highest rainfall in, on record for the month of February that occurred uh, during 2019. And I also had a slide in there that I left that shows you know the National District Corps of Engineers their 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 infrastructure, um, their projects, if you will, uh, and the the biggest in the in the upper right corner is the Wolf Creek Dam. Um, and there were some fascinating videos on YouTube that, were, that, that are, are viewable that show the effects uh, in Wolf Creek Dam of February of 2019. Um, and so um, it was some of the highest releases that they've ever had coming out of Wolf Creek Dam uh, in February of 2019. So that was unusual from the perspective that a lot of our big events have, have kind of impacted the western portion of the state and kind of up through the north border between Tennessee and Kentucky. Um, and they don't go as much to the east such that they would impact Wolf Creek. But this was certainly a case where it, it absolutely did. And it caused our water levels in downtown Nashville to probably go 20 feet above their normal operating level. Then there was September uh, the 13th of 2020. Uh, this was an event um, right in the, the, the deepest of the reds down below the word Nashville there. <clears throat> That's uh, uh, where it most impacted the city of Nashville because you see there that one and a half to two inches of rain, well, that's not a real big deal. But the next slide shows that same event and... That same event, uh, more honed in to the intersection of Davidson County, Williamson County, and Rutherford County, and and again the the red and and even lighter red, you know those those are areas that experience rain of upwards of eight, nine, and ten inches just in Mill Creek alone um, in 2020. Uh, the next slide. Uh, is an, an analysis of flooding in March of 2021. This is the one that we know to have been another atmospheric river. And so, so when this occurred, without my even asking for it, Dr. Talbot fired off an email to his buddies on the West Coast. These are the guys that are part of the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes. And there's about a half dozen guys that work in that group out there. And they, they fired back about a six or seven slide presentation of their analysis of the event that occurred here um, in March of 2021. And so when you look at, you know, the, the, the center, uh, the epicenter of that storm was right over the Nashville airport area there, the, 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 the water records, rain records, obviously being, being that monitored at, at, the, uh, at the airport. Um, so it talks about, you know, three inches of precipitation fell across Tennessee during a 24-hour period on the 28th of March. The highest rainfall amounts greater than six inches observed in central Tennessee. Um, you can tell they must not be from here or, or they would have re referred to it as Middle Tennessee. Um, the um, March of 2021 has been... Um, anomalously wet across Tennessee with some parts of the state receiving more than 200% of normal precipitation. Um, and then some of the, the uh, uh, National Weather Service hydrographs um, from the National Weather Service website, you can see how many events across the um, Middle Tennessee area are are recording levels above action levels into minor and moderate and major flood levels. This was an example of the Duck River uh, during that event that went well into the major flood level. Uh, this slide is the um, uh, Cumberland River uh, at Nashville, which we were, which is the Woodland Street Bridge, the bridge, the, the gauge that's downtown. So it was beyond action level and into minor flood level. So you can see some of the effects of the flooding that occurred uh, at that time. Um, a mere six months later, August 21st, 2021, extreme flooding over Humphreys County in Waverly, Tennessee. Um, and so this is an, an indicator of the estimated rainfall totals. Um, and we know from the next slide, this was a, an, a, an exhibit that I think was in the um, New York Times 
that was a great uh, graphic uh, that shows that the water didn't fall on Waverly, the water just flowed through Waverly. So the bulk of that storm event, McEwen, 17 inches of rain, and then the area to the south and east of McEwen, um, and all that rain flowed down all those creeks, uh, and we know the, the extent of the impact in Waverly. 600 houses swept off their foundations. Um, so it was a staggering event. Um, again, from my buddies out in West Tech, uh, West um, in California, extreme precipitation accumulations over Middle Tennessee. Now they've got that right. So Middle Tennessee resulted in catastrophic flooding. Um, and it talks about this quasi-stationary pattern continued with anomalous atmospheric moisture to create an environment favorable for high intensity and long duration precipitation over parts of central Tennessee. Um, so, and then the last bullet, while this particular event is not characterized as an atmospheric river, it is one example of the many meteorological uh, features that can lead to flood um, production, precipitation, flood, I can't, I'm, I'm in, um, in Tennessee. So it was not an atmospheric river, but it was a, another, I mean, you can see the, the gauge uh, in, in uh, the creek, um, in perhaps in Waverly, where they're well into the major flood level of the, um, the gauge reading on that, on that river. Um, Again, more, more uh, shots of some of the National Weather Service data, <clears throat> the intensity of the rain that fell. There's more description, you know, it was a stationary front in western or central Tennessee combined westerly surface flow allowed for extremely moist air par parcels to rise over central Tennessee, um, inflating thunderstorm and heavy precipitation. So. Um, it was a staggering event. Uh, more details, this is a lot of, of, of stuff that, that only a climate scientist could really digest. Um, <clears throat> but it really just talks in a lot more detail about the impact of that. And then one week later, you know, another one of the tropical storms or hurricanes came ashore uh, in Louisiana and impacted our weather yet again. Um, this is a QPF, the quantitative precipitation forecast. We use that a lot in our National Safe uh, program when we, when we forecast rain going forward. Our real-time simulation and things like that depends on the rain that's defined by these QPFs. Um, and so, uh, from my slide last September, um, you know, I talked about being in the midst of flood recovery from the March event. You know, that March event caused probably some 200 houses in the Seven Mile Creek Basin to flood. We've been buying those houses like crazy. We've bought dozens of those houses. We're tearing down houses even this week uh, that were impacted by that event. Um, and so we're, we're fortunate that we had a Corps of Engineers project underway at that time. That um, um, and, and so we're, we're taking out houses that have flooded multiple times uh, over the decades. Um, and then the other projects, you know, I talked about ramping up home buyout. We, we continue to, to, to do that. And, and because of the focus from, from last March, you know, the, the emphasis has been on Seven Mile Creek, Mill Creek, McCrory Creek. Um, and then we're getting the funding we need. Um, and, then, and then I had a bullet in there in September that said we will continue to upgrade our firm maps across the metro area. Now, just, just um, because I felt like I didn't say anything because it sounded like it wasn't part of the big issue in our first case today. But the fact that you can't find a map doesn't mean the map doesn't exist. So all of our newly developed, drafted flood insurance rate maps exist on the national, on the uh, map service center, msc.fema.gov. Um, you click on a link and it takes you to all of the preliminary maps that are in place. And they've been on our website for two years. They weren't missing last fall. They've been on the website accessible for at least two years. And over much of the last two years, they've shown up as two, in two ways. One is a preliminary map, meaning they haven't quite finished all the review processes, but also as a pending map. And the map um, that, uh, the maps that have, are, are, are less, 
far along the process are, are, are preliminary. The ones that have already been through all the review processes are, are pending, and they, they simply are waiting through the final 180-day review period, something to that effect. And so we went through that on all the maps that were pending last fall, uh, and in February of this year, February of 2022, we adopted 60 new map panels. Um, and largely, to a great extent, these map panels, probably two-thirds of them, were up in the very northern reaches of the county. There's a lot, new, a lot of more detailed mapping up in the Marabone Creek area, the Marabone Lake area, um, up, up toward Goodlettsville. That a lot of those new maps up there, and then other maps around the fringes of the county. Um, those maps were adopted, and what they did in, in, in large part was to, was to capture creek basins that had never been modeled in a detailed fashion before, but they were part of major creek basins that had been modeled and mapped. In the case of these in the, in the area um, east of Interstate 65, north of Brentwood, there were two major creek basins, Brentwood Branch and uh, what was the other one? Michael and Logan, you all remember the other? There was another creek basin. These had always been part of the outer fringe. They were beyond the, the extent of the study. Um, when we modeled um, Seven Mile Creek, which then ran, it, it then then uh, um, becomes a tri it's a trip to Mill Creek and so on. Um, so and now we have also we still have those now are no longer pending. They're part of our effective maps. They've been adopted by the city council back in February. Uh, so there's 60 updated panels, um, and now we have another. 16 panels that are preliminary, and hopefully this fall, those maps will roll into the final review period and, and will ultimately be, be adopted by the City Council sometime next year. Um, those are, are some additional maps. Those are, those are the maps that impact the case that we heard first today. The Brentwood Branch and those tribs, those tribs to Seven Mile Creek, there were significant drainage basins still associated with those tribs. Um, they were, there is ultimately, as you work your way up those trips, there's still a limit to the study. But if you if you look at if you if you compare the size of the basins, um, the the basins are down now to the, about the last square mile. I think that's not part of the modeled map section. So. So those, those will show up this coming year as, as new effective maps. And, um, and Roger, if I could, I know you've said on occasion, because someone do, some folks do latch on to the word new, it's, it's really not new in that it's what's there today. It's not just articulated via a flood map. It's just that the modeling assesses the topography and the associated rain events and, and adds it to our flood map. Is that an accurate the latest, way to say that? The latest LIDAR, you know, we've got great new detailed topographic information. So the risk doesn't models. change when the no. maps come the, out. The risk is yeah. the same. And, and that's our, we say that all the time. People say, oh, you mapped me into the <coughs> floodplain. No, you have a creek in your backyard. You've always been in the floodplain. You just weren't in a mapped floodplain and, and your mortgage company probably didn't realize your proximity to the creek and those kinds of things. So. What we're doing is providing a lot more detailed information, and and it's it. I mean, we, we see the results of this on a regular basis. Some of the houses we're buying right now along Mill Creek, uh, for example, we, you know, after the flood in March, you know, some of these houses were snatched up quickly by what I call opportunists. They're developers. They they here's a flooded house. The owners are just despondent. They're not going to fix it. They they want to sell it for what little they can get out of it, and a and a developer buys them thinking that in six months or 60 days time he's going to turn a hundred thousand dollar profit on a quick flip and the reality is that these houses are they've had multiple flood claims they're they're substantially damaged by all definitions they've got to be elevated six or eight feet and when you tell a developer you know that you're, you're you derail his 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 train ride to a hundred thousand dollar profit and in fact, we we bought out some houses that had already been purchased uh, by some some builders that wanted to just quick flip these things to make a profit on them. We've bought those and torn them down now. So, um, 
factor. And we do get a lot of inputs from the community when they buy homes and move into them. I never knew. I never knew this flooded. I didn't. So, you know, we sort of here look at the front end of the process, but as stormwater, it goes way beyond that to when second, third, fourth generation owners move into facilities. So we do have a bent more toward wanting to warn the public to the greatest extent we can of what these flooding risks are out there. Yeah. And then the last bullet on that, we're, we're, we have actually now installed 23 stream monitoring gauges around the metro area. Um, and so these, these were installed as a result of a grant that we received from the Department of Homeland Security. They are low-cost sensors as opposed to USGS gauges. Uh, and we're in the process right now, actually this week, getting them surveyed in. Um, and so hopefully, relatively soon, we'll have them incorporated into our national system a flood forecasting tool and we'll be able to look at not just the 25 USGS gauges around our system, but 23 more gauges that are really in parts of the, they don't, they don't even have to be on a creek. They can be on, you can, you can mount them on a roadway. And we know that some of the roadways that flood early here, we've never really had a good handle on when the flooding occurs on, on, um, um, Bellevue, what, <laughs> along the river, um, What's the name of our, our road up in, Bell, in Bellevue that we, we, we key on? Um, oh, Hickory? No, no, no the, um, north of the interstate. Highway 100, Highway 70. Or, uh, um, no, I'm losing my I'm losing my mind. I guess. So so anyway, we're looking at, at early warning that there's this water in the roadway. Hope it's in good. Um, <laughs> I could have told you if I hadn't tried to tell you. Okay, so then th this, this week, this past week, the Washington Post says how two one in 1,000 year rain events hit the U.S. in two days. Um, and this is, this is St. Louis and Kentucky. And uh, so there was a lot of discussion, a lot of description. Um, this, this map was in the, um, the article that the Washington Post published on these storms, and it, it, it's described like this. It all began with a zone of high pressure over Bermuda and thunderstorms over the Gulf of Mexico. So here's, there's, a, there's this big high pressure cell over Bermuda and then all the thunderstorms in the Gulf. So it channeled that flow um, around the edge of the, of the high pressure cell in, in Bermuda and pushed that water to the north. Um, the storms injected water vapor from, a warm, from the warm Gulf waters high into the atmosphere where it was blown to the north by winds racing around that high pressure zone. Every day, storms erupted south of Louisiana and reliable flow pumped that tropical air inland. The journey of this sopping air hit a roadblock, however, and a stationary front stretched uh, from Kansas to Virginia, which overlaid a dome of excessively hot air sprawled over the southern United States. All of the atmospheric moisture began to pool near this stalled boundary day after day. Eventually, the amount of moisture grew to near record levels. The waterlogged atmosphere, heated by powerful late July sun, became loaded with storm fuel known as instability. As storms developed along the front, evening after evening, they drew energy from an atmosphere that was very unstable and very wet, and they dropped rain with incredible ferocity. And because the high altitude winds that dictate the motion of thunderstorms were blowing parallel to the front, the downpours moved over the same areas for hours, one after the other. You can see this is the uh, estimated 24-hour estimated rainfall uh, over St. Louis on July 26th, and you can see that you know the the the, the brightest of the yellows in the middle of this is is upwards of you know the 10-inch mark over here. Um, and then a similar uh, illustration for Hazard County, Hazard, and the town of Hazard, Kentucky, um, again with rain upwards of eight or more inches. Um, 
And I haven't heard back from my, my buddy, Dr. Talbot, is in California this week uh, meeting with, with a, a large Corps of Engineers contingency that runs, that dictates how they operate their, um, their reservoir systems, how they discharge from reservoir systems. And so he's, he owes me a report when he comes back because he's with all these guys from that extreme weather group in, in, in uh, California right now. But when we look at, this is another illustration that was in the National Weather Service, uh, and it talked about a conceptual model for the meteorological setup of the flash flooding event that occurred from July 26th to July 30th in eastern Kentucky. Um, and so the way they describe that, the Weather Service describes it as follows. The heavy rain fell north of a stationary front. Well, let me back up just a second, because I keep, I keep running into this term Term, training, training thunderstorms. Has anybody heard the term training thunderstorms? That's when a storm falls along a zone, typically adjacent to a front, and in this case, a, a stalled stationary front, and it just, it dumps in that same area, and the, while the storm is moving, the storm continues to build, and it continues to drop intensive rain along that same zone. So, that the, uh, the training thunderstorms lasted for hours during the night of July 27th into the early morning of July 28th. These storms began to taper off. Another round of thunderstorms then impacted the already soaked region late that night and into the morning of the 29th, adding insult to inju injury. So an interesting phenomenon when you look at this, the rain, you know, all this moisture is blowing up, this big purple arrow from the Gulf, and the rain is falling on the other side of this stationary front. The heavy rain fell north of a stationary front that was anchored across southern Kentucky. Strong low-level winds brought in copious amounts of low-level moisture, which interacted with the stationary front and the upper-level jet stream to produce repeated thunderstorms over the same area for more than six hours, several days in a row. These thunderstorms caused an intense swath of heavy rainfall most of the area saw at least a few inches of rainfall with a narrow band of 10 to 14 inches observed in east central Kentucky. And when you talk about some of the chronological uh, context of this event, the rainfall totals observed between these dates were over 600 percent of normal. While most of the region was drier than normal going into July, this amount of rain in such a short period of time would overwhelm any area simply due to the very high rainfall rates. Uh, there were multiple, you know, rainfall records set uh, in those one or two days. Um, in some cases, um, in Buckhorn, there's a place called Buckhorn Lake, um, had a four-day total of almost 12 inches of rain, a record for that amount of time. Um, so there were, there were a number of, of significant uh, records set. This is another shot of what um, Hazard County looked like. Uh, and you can see that the, the white parts in the middle are, are, the, are the, the absolute highest levels identified in the color coding of rainfall of amounts that fell. Um, and then along the North Fork of the Kentucky River, they went well into major flood level. Um, and so it, so, so when you consider that first sli slide that I showed, you know, with the, the water coming from the Gulf and the high pressure in the, in the cold zone, and um, that, that kind of smacks of an atmospheric river. It looks like, you know, moisture flowing from the Gulf at high, higher uh, altitudes and then crossing that stationary front and hitting those, you know, that that, that kind of looks like an atmospheric river. But I, again, I haven't gotten confirmation back from, from my extreme weather guys in California yet. So um, anyway, that's, um, that's kind of the, the sum of my <laughs> quick presentation on Kentucky right now. So. Okay, thank you, Roger. Um, so I just thought this would be a good opportunity for us to kind of be aware of the new conditions that we're dealing with and also to educate the public since this is on public television about why we have to make some of the hard decisions we make and 
appreciate your comment about you know, I, the maps. I, in my presentation last September, I, I had two slides that addressed higher standards. And some of it include, you know, our four-foot free board requirement and things like that. And, and we're doing, even as we look, you know, we saw it in our last presentation on the Dry Creek Wastewater Plant. You know, we're providing protection levels to the 500-year plus two feet. So, you know, that constitutes a significantly higher standard of protection. Um, and so there, there, there are a dozen different higher standards, uh, m many, many of which are part of what our stormwater regulations require. And, and they're intended to provide that level of protection. Protection, protection of life, protection of property, um, protection of of new people that you know sit on the internet up in their home in Madison, Wisconsin, and think that a, a river lot on the Cumberland River would be a great place to build a house, and not understanding a lot of the, the limitations associated with building in close proximity to a floodplain or a buffer, a floodway or a floodway buffer, you know those kinds of things. And so, I think that that we we have some great higher standards in place here. Um, uh, Tom and I both are associated quite extensively with the National Association of State Floodplain Managers. Uh, to the point that we, we're in constant dialogue with people, with floodplain managers all over the United States. Uh, um, I, I've got the, the uh, former, or the, one of the founders of this national organization more than 40 years ago has spent the weekend at our home. He and his wife uh, stayed with us one weekend in Franklin. And and uh, so we're, we're, we're connected at a pretty high level. And people are amazed at, at our four-foot free board and some of the standards we enforce. Um, but we do it, you know, to protect people. It's one of the reasons why when we get a set of preliminary maps and we know there's not going to be any changes to them, we, we enforce those requirements. It's it's what we do to make sure that just because the city council hasn't adopted it doesn't mean that it, it that those new preliminary maps don't define a level of risk or, or a, an element of design that's important to incorporate, even though we may be a year away from having adoption by the city council. So um, I think it just, it's prudent to do that. So Yeah. Thank you, Roger. All right. Yeah, it's 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 you know it's really challenging, and we've got kind of two trains of thought related to the regulated community. You know, traditionally it's kind of the the burden is on the permit applicant. Polluter pays. You know, if, if you're going to change the environment, you 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 bear most of the burden of of conveying to um, these public interest uh, representatives. You know, why it is that you want to do. But on the other hand. There's also these fundamental principles of investment-backed expectations, prior expectation related to planning, uh, public notice requirements, public meeting notice requirements, you know, having agendas that people can be aware of that the government is operating under so they can, uh, they can make their private investments in an informed manner based upon government decisions uh, that are not being made in a back room or not being made in a vacuum. And it's, it's really hard to kind of balance all that out when, uh, when folks are trying to juggle their uh, their uh, fast-paced lives with all the all the changing environments that we're in, including the changing climate, so so we try to do our best and we try to deal with each case on a case-by-case -case basis. I try not to set a bad precedent. So uh, anyway, anybody got any questions or comments they want to make before we get out of here? All right, we appreciate your service. All right, so uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right, got a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All right, motion been made and seconded to adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, we're adjourned. Me too. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.